So let's officially start. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Carlos. I am the Chief Content Director at Change Lawyers and welcome to Race as a Proxy for Risk. This is a, the second part in a three-part special event series between my organization, Change Lawyers, and Uncommon Law. Um, and for those of you who don't know Change Lawyers, we are a foundation, we're a legal foundation, and we fund the next generation of lawyers and activists. Uh, before we begin today, I do want to acknowledge that there's most likely a mix of emotions in the room. Um, last week, if you all joined us for part one of this series, uh, as we were talking about mass incarceration and the legacy of slavery, uh, Keith and Sack were up here talking about um, all of that, the Derek Chauvin verdict was being announced uh, in real time. Uh, and it was it was really emotional um, and it was very it was very highly charged for a lot of us. Um, and I do want to make one thing clear, though, um, to sort of set the tone for the next hour. Uh, Derek Chauvin being rightfully convicted of murdering George Floyd is injustice, at least not in the eyes of change lawyers. It's just accountability. Uh, justice would be if George were still here to be able to hold his daughter. Um, and so with this mix of emotions, um, I want to just uh, put out good intentions into the room. I'm grateful for all of you. I'm grateful that we have the next hour to make space and show up and, and talk and build power together. Uh, with this in mind, uh, we will be talking about issues that primarily affect BIPOC folks. Um, and so we're gonna center these voices in the next room. We're gonna center identities, uh, racial and otherwise, and we're gonna center emotions and vulnerability. So we invite you all to um, share a little bit about yourself in the comments section if you're comfortable with that. But do keep in mind that if you are not a uh, BIPOC, um, just be mindful of how much space you take in the uh, chat box. So with that in mind, I wanna introduce um, our folks today, uh, starting off with Keith from Uncommon Law. Uh, for those of you who do not know him, um, you should definitely get to know him. Keith uh, is an amazing advocate and lawyer who's been doing this work for over 20 years. He's the founder and leader of Uncommon Law. Um, and they are an organization that Change Lawyers um, really close hold, close, holds very closely um, for their transformative work um, in trying to um, redefine what it means to bring people home from prison. Um, in 2018, Keith was selected as one of the Obama Foundation's inaugural fellows, and he's been recognized recently by the James Irvine Foundation with their leadership award. So welcome, Keith, nice to see you. Hello, Carlos. Thank you. Nice to see you, too. Um, I'm also going to introduce uh, Nicole D. Porter, who manages the Sentencing Project's state and local advocacy efforts on everything from sentencing reform to voting rights to eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. So basically everything that's in the news right now, uh, Nicole uh, is doing. Um, and so Nicole has been honored in so many ways, um, but one of... Um, the coolest, I think, is um, she was named by Essence Magazine as one of the new civil rights leaders for her work in trying to eliminate and dismantle mass incarceration. Uh, so welcome, Nicole. Uh, really, really happy to have you and your organization represented here. Glad to be joining you all this afternoon. Thanks for having me. And uh, I am also going to introduce Emile De Weaver. Uh, Emil has uh, an incredible story, and um, I think that his perspective in particular um, is going to add a lot to the conversation today. So Emil is a fellow at Impact Justice. He's a Black community organizer. He's a literary writer, a journalist, and the co-founder of PrisonRenaissance.org, um, which he co-founded while he was serving a 67-year 67 uh, 67 life sentence in prison. He was, his sentence was commuted by Governor Jerry Brown in 2017. And right now, in addition to being a fellow at Impact Justice, Emil is also working full time as a product specialist for pilot.com and also as a guest lecturer and freelance writer. So it is my uh, honor to welcome Emil to the conversation. Hi, Carlos, how you doing? Thanks for having me here. Thank you for coming. And Keith, um, I'm done, I'll let you take it away. All right. Well, I, I first want to say um, I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be uh, speaking with both of you today. And, and uh, I'll note for, for Carlos that 
Emil's got some updates, I think, to his his uh, sort of bio. He, he's, he's been a busy man, and uh, a lot. Uh, I'm sure. Hopefully, he'll be able to to, to update us with, with some of that. I, I personally do know that uh, he considers himself. Um, he's a, he's a formerly incarcerated writer and activist and senior strategist now with the Prison Policy Initiative. Uh, he's proudly displaying displaying his his shirt there, um, and uh, hopefully, he'll talk be able to talk to us about about that work. Um, but I, um, you know, the, the only other thing, the, Carlos, that you mentioned um, and discussing very briefly the um, the Chauvin verdict, um, the, I, I heard you use the word accountability. I don't think we've got that, um, but we do have a, a guilty verdict. Um, we don't know whether accountability will ever happen, but um, I, I look forward to having that kind of conversation uh, as well. Um, today, we're really, you know, the, we call this talk race as a pro proxy for risk. We're really focusing on the idea of discretionary parole. Uh, and so that covers uh, the decision that that really results in the release for some people, for a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, they're released from prison. Uh, we're talking about a population of people who are serving life sentences who will not be released unless and until a parole board or in some cases a governor says it's safe to do so. Uh, this is a type of sentence that is, it's different from those that are of a fixed duration. You know, for people who are sentenced to five or 10 years in prison, they are automatically released when that period expires, you know, often even before that, if they earn sort of credit uh, towards that. Um, but for people serving life sentences with the possibility of parole, they serve a certain minimum number of years, uh, seven years, 15 years, 25 years, before they become eligible to be considered for parole. And when they are considered, uh, they have to convince a parole board. Uh, in California, these folks are appointed by the governor uh, they have to, to convince them that they have changed their lives enough so they can safely be released. So these are parole commissioners who are deciding whether or not the person before them presents an unreasonable risk to public safety. Uh, nationwide, there are more than 200,000 people serving these sentences. Uh, in California, we have more than 35,000 of them, 35,000. Um, and as we as we get into this this issue of what these sentences look like, and and as we apply this this lens of what's the the racial aspect of this, what are the racial implications? We'll talk a little bit about um, some of the data. There's not nearly enough that's available. There was a, a study a couple of years ago by a law professor. Her name is Kristen Bell, um, where she reviewed hundreds of parole hearing transcripts, and she found, uh, among other things, that black parole applicants were three times less likely to be granted parole when compared to non-black parole applicants. There's some more recent data that was analyzed by Michael Brodheim, who, Mr. Brodheim is someone who was doing research and litigation even while serving a life sentence himself. Um, and he found that black parole applicants are granted parole at the lowest rate of all racial groups. Uh, and this is looking at California data uh, under both Governor Brown and Governor Newsom. The, that fact remains the same, even under Governor Newsom. He also found that blacks are much less likely to be granted parole when the commissioner is white compared to when the commissioner is of any other race. Uh, in other words, race matters in these proceedings. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise based on the fact that we know race matters everywhere else in this country. Um, I look forward to doing a show at some point with Mr. Brodheim so he can he can share his work with us. Um, and um, I think one of the, I think, important pieces of, of his work is that he had to sue the state of California, the parole board and Department of Corrections for years just to get a court order to make them give him the race data. They wouldn't even give it to him. And I personally wish that we we had prison and parole officials who were willing to tackle these issues head on rather than pretend that that everything's fine uh, and and to not even look 
at this troubling data. Uh, so with that, we're looking at race. We're looking at the discretionary parole process. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, Emil, if that's okay. Um, having been sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, I'm wondering how, just how hopeful you were that you would ever be released, and and then what was your sense of about what you would need to do in order to be released? And and I, I suspect that may be something that um, sort of evolved from the time you first got to prison. Uh, two years later when you were approaching the, the parole board. Can you talk a little bit about that process for you? Yeah, I mean, I, th I mean, I think it's important to set a little context, right? And I think that when we're talking about criminal justice and when we're talking about like white supremacy in America, we need to acknowledge that there's always a story of what's happening and then there's actually what's happening. And, those, and, th and that's like a duality that's gonna exist in this struggle until we uh, get better at doing better. And so you mentioned that like I had life with the possibility of parole and that's the story, but the reality is there was no possibility of my parole. Um, number one, I had, I had been sentenced to 67 years to life uh, when I was uh, 18 years old. Uh, so I was expected to die in prison. Number two, when I was sentenced to 67 to life uh, and the, the way that uh, the political landscape was in California, Hugo Pinnell was serving like his uh, 28th year in prison on a seven year to life sentence. Sandra Davis Lawrence was serving her 21st year in prison on a seven to life sentence she got in 1978. Um, so to answer your question, for me, there was no possibility of parole when I, a poor black high school dropout was sentenced to 67 years to life. Um, I, I mean, human beings are very resilient. And so like, you know, we need to figure out how to go on. And so how I figured out how to go on was I convinced myself that I didn't know how I was gonna get out of prison, but I was gonna find a way out of prison. I dedicated my life to getting out of prison. I, at the time I told myself, I'm gonna write my way out of prison. Um, and that was just a project I worked on for about 15 years. Um, uh, which is how long it took for the political landscape to start to shift a little bit where there did become like cracks in the door and there were like opportunities and possibilities to get out. And I speak particularly of the passage of Senate bills 260 and 261, which uh, made it so that like people who were sentenced to these extraordinary sentences before they were 25 could get a parole hearing after 20 or 25 years. And so you you had this uh, with these Senate bills you just mentioned. You all how, how did that impact your? I don't know if it's attitude towards the parole board, but certainly your prospects for release were were improved. But I'm specifically interested in your thinking of what it would then take to get through this process. What was your thinking when you saw? Oh, I'm going to get a chance to go to the parole board soon. Um, I mean, because I had been like. Labor. I, I think that my story, like I, I had been assuming that I was going to be able to come up before someone at some point that was undefined in my life and have a chance to go home. So I had been preparing for the last 20 years. Um, and before it before it was clearly defined as a parole board, what I was doing was like just creating a professional life for myself, creating networks, creating uh, trying to generate capital so I could have something to come home to. Uh, but once it became clear that you can go to the parole board, I started attending uh, I started t attending more groups. I was already in groups, but I started attending more groups because I understood that the language that the parole board requires uh, to, to, to grant its very low grant rate uh, was uh, something that you learned in these groups. Uh, and so I, I started going to a lot of the rehabilitation self-help groups and preparing for board rather than some kind of unexpected, like before just like I'm preparing for anything. When it became clear that you can prepare for board, I started to prepare for board. Right. Well, you, you mentioned the very low parole grant rates um, and really for, the, for the, the last 40 years in California at least, um, while the, the statute that governs this process mandates that parole grants are supposed to be the norm in reality, 
only 16% of the scheduled parole hearings have resulted in parole grants. And that was true even last year. At the, the height of the pandemic, when we should be finding ways to uh, release people, especially people who are older and sicker, and people who present the lowest risks to public safety, we um, still, in California at least, had only 16% of the scheduled hearings result in parole grants. You know, and to, to take a step back, you know, we, we're, we're in a country that has spent its entire history making all of us believe that, that, that Black people are inherently violent and dangerous. And this goes for our kids too, right? Um, and as a result, we're, we're more likely to be stopped without just cause by police, more likely to be arrested at school, to have force used against us, to be killed by police, to be charged with and convicted of crimes carrying longer sentences, more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to be denied parole, denied bail. Um, and once we get to prison, black folks are more likely to receive rule violation reports and to be housed in higher security level prisons. Um, and when you look at the, the issue of the discretionary parole decision on the back end of all of that, we see that, that um, black people make up almost half of the people serving life sentences nationally. Um, I talked a little bit about some preliminary data on California's racial disparities in parole hearing outcomes. N Nicole, I want to turn to you because, you know, I often turn to the sentencing project when I'm trying to figure out what the actual data is on, on parole hearings uh, and other sentencing issues for sure. Uh, can you talk about how difficult it has been to obtain race data when it comes to parole hearing outcomes and and um, and what the limited data is telling us. Yeah, well, thank you um, for the question and thank you for including me in the conversation. Emil, it's exciting to um, see, you know, your new role at Prison Policy Initiative. So I wanna definitely talk to you more about that offline and congrats on that, by the way. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Keith, to your question though, the reality is, is that there is, um, there is an underdeveloped analysis on what the outcomes are in terms of racial disparity for discretionary parole hearings. You know, preparing for this conversation, I reacquainted myself with information out of New York that's a couple of years old. And um, as far as I'm aware, this is one of the only um, sort of public accounts of racial disparity outcomes on discretionary parole hearings because New York also has a sizable parole um, eligible lifer population. And the New York Times a few years ago was looking at outcomes in discretionary parole hearings for life sentence individuals. And so in an analysis from 2018 to 2020, um, there was a disproportionate, uh, blacks were underrepresented in parole releases for um, parole eligible individuals. Of the folks who were released, who were eligible for release from October 2018 through October 2020, 41% were white um, compared to 34% who were black and 33% who are Latinx. Um, and you know, this, is an underrepresentation of the number of African Americans and Latinx um, folks who are sentenced to parole eligible life sentence in New York. Nationally, one out of every 20 black men in prison is in prison on a life uh, prison term. So that's 20% of the entire prison population. Um, and so of, you know, total people serving um, time inside. So, this analysis, you know, similar conversations need to happen in other states where there's discretionary parole for life students individual. And I'm curious in California, um, it's, you know, interesting that there's been an effort to get this information from your parole board, that there's, uh, there's been a need to sue the parole board in order to obtain the information. And then there's going to be an ongoing need to disclose that information, do regular reports out of racial disparity and um, you know demographic outcomes of parole eligible um, releases and you know people who go before discretionary um, parole hearings. I just say 
that anywhere in the system where there's bias, anywhere in the system where there's discretion, there is implicit bias, if not explicit bias, and if not the need to include um, practices and policies that will help counter any implicit, if not explicit biases that disadvantage Black and Latinx and other BIPOC um, individuals who you know, receive any discretionary review, whether or not it's for parole or any other review, including when a governor and your, your governors in particular, um, use of their authority on commutations and clemency petitions. So any point in the system where there's discretion and, you know, nationally, this conversation happens way before we get to discretionary parole hearings, but certainly in the context of discretionary parole, um, operationalizing and normalizing practices that help counter any implicit or explicit bias is what's needed. And it's hard to uncover this because people haven't been looking at this. You know, much of the movement at this point is really expanding parole eligibility. The Sentencing Project launched a campaign at the end of 2018, the Campaign to End Life Imprisonment, that talks about the problems of the growth of life imprisonment. We have more people sentenced to life in prison today than were actually in prison total in 1970 at the national level. And that's true in almost half the states, including California. So there's such a focus in that part of the effort to challenge mass incarceration to expand parole eligibility that shining a light on the racially disparate outcomes for people who are currently eligible for parole releases is an underexplored um, strategy and underexplored um, an underexplored need in challenging mass incarceration. Although clearly, it's right there; it's right, it's front and present um, to why we have to end life imprisonment outright and open up authentic, genuine opportunities for release and provide the remedies for release for people who have currently been disappeared to life imprisonment and mass imprisonment um, in general. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there seems to be uh, in most places, certainly here in California, uh, a, a willful ignorance of the, the facts of, about the role that race plays um, in our parole hearings. I mentioned uh, Dr. Kristen Bell's work, her, her study was called A Stone of Hope. And it was actually a review of um, several hundred parole hearing transcripts that were intended to reflect the parole board's new approach to considering the possibility for releasing those who were sentenced in their youth, people who were under 18 when they received their life sentences were entitled under Senate Bill 260 to have a special kind of parole hearing at which their youth are supposed to be considered. It's supposed to be a, a greater um, expectation that they would be released. So the, the fact that she found that people who were black were uh, much less likely to be granted parole um, was a huge concern. I mean, overall their, their parole grant rates for, for young people receiving life sentences were, were not any different than everyone else who was going to the parole board. But the, the fact that she was able to identify that race, the race of the parole applicant was a major factor. And then you had, not only did the parole board not say, we're concerned about that. We should learn more about that. We should do our own study to figure out beyond these you know, three, 400 cases, how widespread is this issue? How do we, should we retrain our commissioners? How should we change the criteria by which we conduct these, these proceedings? They didn't do any of that. Instead, they fought for two years to not release any race data because they didn't want a bigger study to be done. They didn't, not only didn't do, did they not do their own study, they thwarted efforts of research to do their, to, to do further study. Uh, fortunately, as I mentioned, Mr. Brodheim and others and, and Dr. Bell, went back to, to get more data to, to tell to tell a fuller story. Um, so I'm, I'm curious now, you know, for, for the sort of the experience of this process and get your perspective here, Emil. Um, I'm wondering about your thoughts about um, 
whether the way that people are expected to show up at the parole hearings lends itself to the same kind of biases we see at other stages in, in our criminal legal legal process. I mean, I would say absolutely it does. And, uh, and like a, a quick, a, a couple quick examples of like what my impression of was of what it takes to show up at board, you know, when I went to board uh, uh, several years ago. And um, there's a, I have a group of friends and like we all do, did very well at board. And when we hang around people, often what they jokingly say is like, wow, you guys should be therapists. Um, and I think that that is the, you know, that, that's hyperbolic, but I think that comes very close to the standard of what like the board wants to see when you come into a boardroom. And what that means in practical terms is they are looking for people who are articulate, if not hyper articulate. They are looking for people who translate to white culture very well. Uh, they are looking for people who, uh, who legitimate the state practice of mass incarceration and take on responsibility of the state's like um, bad policies and be like, yeah, these policies are just and I deserve to be in this situation. And I think like a really striking example of how that plays out comes with this uh, 70 year old man that I knew in a group once and he was talking about his experiences at board and he was talking about how he kept getting denied and he was, and he had the knowledge that he was getting denied because he had a thick Southern accent that in California is very much associated with not being educated. Uh, and so he had enough awareness to understand what was happening that he wasn't articulate enough to meet the board's muster. And he had this accent that he could do nothing about. So he was this man telling this story and it was just heartbreaking because he was like, I can't change the way I speak. I've taken all of the programs. I'm 70 years old. I'm not committing any more crimes and I can't get out because of the way I sound. And what that translates into is he couldn't get out because he was a Southern black man. He couldn't get out because he couldn't present in a way that makes white people in white culture feel comfortable, uh, which is generally presenting as like, you know, they expect a white male to present. Um, uh, by contrast, I did very well in board because I'm a professional writer, so I'm hyper articulate and I know how to translate. Um, and, and all of this plays into the biases that ra surrounding race that already exist in the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, you're, I'm, I'm reminded uh, of a, a, a time a few years ago when I was um, in a parole hearing and the, the client was you know, doing a great, great job laying out his, his story. And at one point, the, one of the commissioners comment, oh, you sound so articulate, which we all know <laughs> what that means. We and, all and have I, stories about that. <laughs> and, and I just couldn't, I couldn't resist. I said, you know, Commissioner, I'm gonna, let me explain something to you, what that means when you say that. And I, I, I took a minute or two and, and, and shared my perspective on how that's actually offensive, what she, what she thinks she intends as, as a compliment. Um, and you know, at the end of the hearing, she actually granted that person parole. And um, she said that in my closing, I too sounded articulate. <laughs> um, but, but there are a lot of moments that I've, that I've had um, where I see that a big part of my role as, as the attorney and advocate is to help the commissioners understand who my client is, to, to help them be able to move all the other things out of the way for them to be able to hear and see the client for themselves. Um, but I mean, the experience is exactly what you, you pointed to, Emil, that if people don't present in a certain way or have someone to help sort of create that 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 filter for the parole board, they're, they're stuck. And I actually have the same question for you, Nicole, if you have you know thoughts about whether there's something about the way people show up in their hearings that lends itself to those same biases that we've been we've been talking about at every other stage in the, in the criminal legal process. Well, I mean, I think the the practice has been to operate to operationalize. 
practices with the goal to reduce implicit, if not explicit bias in these discretionary hearings for parole at the, at the um, back end of someone's in prison um, in experience and then you know at sentencing during the pretrial phase and sentencing um, phase for people on the front end um, the challenge is how to do that so at the sentencing project there's one aspect of our uh, policy making recommendations around racial impact statements which we encourage in the adoption and development of uh, proposed sentencing laws um, so that is at the legislative phase in trying to address the um, the racism and the bias of lawmakers in developing, you know, proposed ways to disappear people um, because of who they imagine to be um, that they're, you know, trying to disappear and lock up. But the big picture for racial impact statements is that it wouldn't just be within legislation, it would also be and other uh, points of discretion in the criminal legal process, including possibly at um, for discretionary parole hearings or for a meta conversation within amongst a parole board to operationalize decision making points for parole board members to a, a, to sort of shift standards and shift the practices in um, a review process to try to get at some of the implicit and explicit biases that might undermine or disadvantage a black or brown or other BIPOC um, residents um, attempt at, at release. Other um, efforts are around, you know, sh um, shifting the standard of those discretionary release hearings so that there's a presumption towards release. Um, in pending legislation, well, in legislation that was pending last Congress at the federal level that was sponsored by Senator Cory Booker and actually Representative Karen Bass in California to allow a sentence review for people in the federal system because there is no parole in the federal um, system. It would apply across the board, regardless of offense, um, for people who served at least 10 years in prison allowing a pathway back into court for sentence review. So essentially creating another remedy for release um, because their parole isn't a possibility at the federal system and also to change the standard of what those release considerations are. So instead of a appointed board, it would be a, it would be a judge. There would be a presumption towards release um, uh, after so many reviews uh, by the applicant um, for release. The first or second review, the individual would receive information in terms of what they um, needed to do to improve their subsequent review hearing. And there would be a rebuttable presumption towards release. So the shift is on the state to demonstrate why the person should not be released if they meet certain criteria, trying to shift away from the crime of conviction towards what the institutional record might be and who the person might be at the time of that review, 10 years into their imprisonment or um, 10 years past their imprisonment whenever they choose to go up for a review. And then to also automate these review processes so the burden is not on the individual who may be suffering from a bunch of different stressors due to their, due to the trauma of imprisonment. Um, so creating a new process for that. So I just say this to say that we are in sort of an emerging conversation around this effort to end life imprisonment, trying to expand parole eligibility, and then also look at these discretionary release hearings to shift the standard around them so that there's a presumption towards release and then to also try to counter the implicit biases that might be disadvantaging BIPOC um, petitioners who are seeking release as well. That's, that's great. I mean, those are some great ideas. We need to uh, you know, do, do some more of that here in California, particularly when it relates to um, recognizing that the, the parole board has yet to make the kind of changes that we know they should and whether um, we can find some better and more meaningful pathways into court to get courts to to step in and, and right some of these wrongs. Um, and I know that over the over the years, certainly it's been litigation primarily driven by people incarcerated 
who are the main litigators in this particular area of the law, have uh, pushed the parole board towards in increasing the rate at which it grants parole, but we're still only at 16% of scheduled hearings resulted in parole grants. So we got a long way way to go. Um, Emil, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, and I think after this, we may may check in with Carlos to see if he has some um, questions from, from the audience. Uh, what recommendations you might have, Emil, um, for things we might do to eliminate or at least reduce the role of bias in the discretionary parole uh, process? Um, and and what do you see as the, the barriers to, to getting there, if, if it's even possible? Well, one, every, any, everything is possible. I mean, I think that we have to start from the presumption of possibility. Like at the, at, you know, I, I think that, you know, you know, in this country, you know, we're a lot of things. Uh, and one thing that like, it's hard to deny is like, we are the masters of production. We create, we have created consumerism. We produce, we know how to produce what we want to produce, right? The question is, do we want to produce it, right? The prison system that we have is something that we have chosen to intentionally produce. The question is, do we want to produce something else? Uh, and ways that we can uh, change the parole board. I mean, Nicole mentioned this a couple of times, but I think it's so important that it bears uh, saying again, it's presumptive release. Like, we... I think we need to stress presumptive release and Nicole has spoken at length about it, so I won't repeat it, but I just really want to stress the importance of that. Uh, the second thing is um, we need to put some serious thought into changing who our gatekeepers of the parole system is. Like we are having this conversation in a system that the entire nation has, in, has admitted is broken and is racially biased. Our parole boards are made up of all of the people who comprise this broken racially biased system. District attorneys, former district attorneys, former police officers, all people who have contributed to the problem that we're currently trying to solve are the people making the decisions on most of these parole boards. Uh, another problem with parole boards is it's to, it, they are too they are they are too political a position in the wrong way, and that is a governor of the state promote, uh, 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 nominates a commissioner, which means um, he has his political career to consider when he's nominating uh, 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 people to be people to be like parole commissioners. And so I think one thing that we need to do is it needs to stop being an appointed position and it should be an elected position. Um, uh, uh, because the person who the commissioner needs to be accountable to is the community it serves, not to the politician who's trying to get elected again or trying to go on and become president of the United States. And so he needs the votes of like, or like uh, or, you know, a large portion of the country who's racist. Uh, so, um, I think that that's uh, a very important thing that we can do is like make com make commissioners electable and let the communities who the decisions actually impact have a say in who's making those decisions. And I think that to your point, the biggest challenge to that is plain and simple, it's power. Like if we're talking about a system that is rife with racial balance, racial um, imbalance, then we're talking about racial oppression. And if we're talking about racial oppression, then we're talking about white supremacy because racial oppression is just an ends, it's just a means to an end. And if we're talking about white supremacy, then we are invariably talking about power because we are talking about power structures. Um, and so the resistance to change is the resistance to who has the power and who, or who thinks that they deserve the power and who doesn't. And the idea that a parole commissioner would be elected by the very community that they're supposed to serve shifts a balance of power that will be resisted by the status quo, which is a white supremacist status quo. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it just it, it just tells you, or it tells me anyway, that uh, anyone who's, who feels like our current process and system is a fair one. Uh, is telling you all you need to know uh, about their position, about who they are, what their what their real beliefs are, and their commitment to this white supremacist structure that keeps black and brown folks inside. 
Um, I want to pause there. I want to first, you know, thanks to both of you. I want to see if uh, if there have been any questions or comments coming in um, from the audience that Carlos wants to share with us. Yeah, I think Emil right now, that last um, little bit from you <laughs> really got folks riled up. Um, because I think he does that, that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I count on it. <laughs> um, and I think the issue is that, so Change Lawyers has been running little polls on our Instagram stories in the last week, asking people like what they want to know about this and what they want to ask you all. And one theme that keeps coming up is sort of the fundamentals. I think that right now the, the parole process is sort of where the uh, DA's issue was at a few years ago, where people just didn't know that this is a thing. A lot it, it flies under the radar for a lot of folks. So um, just to sort of go back to the base, um, can you talk a little bit about the parole themselves? And this is for all of you. Can you talk about the parole board themselves? Like, are they like what is their racial makeup? Are they predominantly white? Um, you touched on this already, Emil, but one thing we've gotten is um, why is it that progressive politicians who have the ability to theoretically appoint progressive board members? don't or like do they does it does that even make a difference it within the structure i'll 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 kick us off a little bit you know the um california's parole board there are 17 commissioners um and i think right now last check at 14 or 15 of them um have backgrounds in some type of law enforcement capacity uh, and it's been that way for as long as i've been been doing this work really um and they, they generally serve for, for three years, a uh, minimum. They get appointed to three-year terms, but they often stay for, for quite a few years um, beyond that. It's, and um, there's, a, there's a decent racial mix, but it, it's overridden by the sort of philosophy, the law enforcement philosophy and training. Um, uh, we, we, I think most of us know that some of the... Um, some of the worst and most racist cops may be black and brown cops. Um, so, so the race of the commissioner doesn't tell you much. The data tells you um, that if you're black and you're you're being considered for parole, you're more likely to be denied. Doesn't matter who the commissioner is. Now, the numbers are slightly different across racial groups among commissioners, and I, and I think. Uh, the work that Mr. Broadheim is doing right now is really going to shed a lot more light on that and, and hopefully will inform some future appointment decisions uh, for the governor's office. But I look forward to, to, to uh, learning more about his, his studies. They're preliminary at this point, but uh, that, that's my take on it. Can I just jump in? So, I mean, there's a strategy in improving parole outcomes. There's an assumption that if people have different backgrounds, then that will improve parole release rates. I think that that is, a, that. In the, you know, honestly, that's a recommendation that the Sentencing Project, you know, works to advance and a lot of its reports and studies uh, charting growth in life imprisonment and other um, factors leading to such a high number of folks um, sentenced to life in prison, death. Um, by incarceration. Um, you, and that is an active strategy that I've seen coalitions in Missouri and Virginia work on. And I, it, I, it is an untested and unproven strategy, whether or not focusing all that social capital on um, broadening out the backgrounds of uh, gubernatorial appointees to the parole board in a particular state is actually going to improve uh, you know, authentic opportunities for release for people in discretionary hearings. But that is a strategy that, you know, organizing campaigns and advocates are investing a lot of sort of social capital and time into. Um, so we will see if they're, if successful, if the outcomes improve. I mean, I think, you know, we have sort of a window into the possibility of that given, um, at this point, a decades long project of working to diversify police departments, hoping for better outcomes or diversifying other aspects of the legal system, hoping for better outcomes and knowing that there's an underlying structure that the United States criminal legal apparatus reinforces. So no matter who works on behalf of the state as part of that criminal legal apparatus, the disadvantages for black residents for black and brown residents are still there. 
unless there's an effort to consciously counter the implicit and explicit biases that show up every day from the point of arrest to the point of sentencing to the point of discretionary parole hearings. Um, and that is all to say that it's not that, that is, it's not that there's not work to do in terms of engaging and critiquing the backgrounds of current parole board members and fighting for broader uh, perspectives in terms of who is sat on boards and hopefully um, that their uh, backgrounds in social work or education or healthcare um, creates open pathways for empathy that makes it, um, you know, discretionary hearings uh, better in terms of the interaction and also the outcomes for people eligible for uh, those discretionary hearings. Uh, but that it's not a panacea and that, there, you know, and that at the end of the day, we have to work to counter racism, because if even people with a social work background that are working in a racist system, if they're not doing the day to day work to um, counter how racism shows up and how that may un unconsciously <laughs> reinforce it then they're still working in a racist system that reinforces racist outcomes every day. And so there's just a lot of work to do around that, in addition to changing the underlying laws that contribute to disappearing someone to prison and these extreme sentences that subject people to a life imprisonment um, term to begin with. Thank you so much for those, those comments, Nicole. I think you're you, you right, right on point. Um, we, we actually have a... In California, there's an assembly bill 1210 that is intended to um, bring a better mix of people in different back backgrounds, not because it's gonna solve all or even most of the problems, but because it's more likely to bring more empathy and understanding um, on the part of the parole board so that their, their, um, their hearings reflect um, the kind of cultural competence and um, uh, compassion that we really are looking for so that they can um, better connect with the people who are applying for parole and what we, what we have without those, those sort of broad range of disciplines. And it's not nearly gonna be enough. Like it, it can help, but as long as they're using the same regulatory parole suitability factors, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna end up with the same problem that we have already. Um, so another thing that's coming from this conversation is, uh, Nicole and you in particular we talked about this earlier in the hour, um, how at every point where there's personal discretion, there's a possibility for, um, things to go wrong. So, um, and I'll just put this actual, this question on the screen. Um, it's going to cover your faces for a little bit, but you'll be able to, to read it yourselves. So what can we do about all these like inflection points where there is personal discretion and sentencing? And can you also give us a, a, a little like 101 on where those points exist in the chain? Well, for discretionary parole, particularly given sort of where we started this conversation this afternoon, publishing racially, dis uh, publishing de demographic outcomes of people who are released by parole, particularly you know, in California, and this is a practice that should happen in every state, is a place to start. That is a practice that is assumed to impact the decision-making on the pretrial and sentencing um, side for judges and um, uh, pretrial offices in states that publishing that data creates transparency um, and shines a light on the individual practices and presumably helps, you know, just like we talk about cognitive behavioral theory for um, justice involved residents who are, you know, under some form of supervision or surveillance, that same sort of practice is thought to, um, you know, change the cognitive um, uh, uh, impact of, of legal practitioners who are employing that discretion in um, those discretionary parts of the system. So that would be one place to start given that this is sort of an emerging conversation and we're trying to build this out. 
is creating a transparency where that is automatically recorded to shine a light on the practices of, of boards with the hope of exposing any disparate outcomes and then creating you know, authentic ways to create equity in release decisions and in discretionary decisions. So that would be one um, mechanism to, to focus on. Emil, you have anything on this one? I have a, a comment or two. Yeah, I, I do. I think that um, to, one to answer your question, like the the, the I don't know of very many mechanisms of accountability uh, uh, to to check uh, personal bias and like racism uh, in a parole hearing. You can uh, take it. Uh, you can take a decision to court, uh, and that can gain you various uh, successes or not successes, but the thing about taking a case to court is you need a cause of action, right? And so one of the things that uh, we could do for parole hearings is create a cause of action based on racial bias. Like California recently passed, um, I, I think it's Assembly Bill, let me see. It's uh, Assembly Bill 25. For two, which is a great model that basically acknowledges, like, man, our system is broken and it's and it's and it's deeply impacted uh, by racial bias. And they created a cause of action based on uh, a conviction based on race. And whereas before, historically in our country, like the Supreme Court decided that, hey, you know, we know our system is racist, but like, you know, you have to prove personal racism. It's not enough for it to be structural. It's not enough for you to give me the data that it's that is wrong. And like this dissenting uh, opinion in that case was like, you guys are essentially saying there's such thing as too much justice, that it would be too much work to actually do your job. And so California has like, built on that and they have created a cause of action based on race and it says that and it gives you and it enumerates right because there's a way that you can be very slick about race and be like oh it wasn't race so they have enumerated if you can prove any one of these things you have proven that this was a conviction based on race and it can be vacated mm -hmm. and we need the same thing for our parole processes we need a legislation to create a cause of action so that when the people responsible to our community aren't doing our jobs, the community itself has, has something to arm themselves with and do the jobs that states aren't doing. They can, they, can, they can take it to court and they have a very clear cause of action to challenge a parole denial. Let's do that. Y'all gonna right. do that in California? There you go, there we go. <laughs> uh, see, all kinds of things can come from these, these conversations. <laughs> two, two quick things about that, one, uh, and and I, mean, I think you're talking about the, the Racial Justice Act, which is, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an effort right now to make that retroactive. But we want to, as you said, we want to make sure that the ability to identify race as a factor in pro hearing outcomes is what we, what's missing. Like that right now, there's no, there's no, it doesn't extend to pro hearing proceedings. So if someone uh, is, a, is a victim of, you know, uh, explicit racism in their pro hearing, there's no cause of action. There's nothing they can they can do. But I would also say that even where that exists at sentencing um, or some anywhere in someone's criminal legal proceeding, um, where we where we provide this sort of private you know cause of action or, or way to get some relief, um, the the question I, I really heard was about accountability, and I think there's a deeper systemic missing piece here. If we just can can individualize the remedy and the relief, we never touch the system, right? Accountability is really about holding those decision makers, those system, the people who run the systems accountable, get them out of office. If, they're, if, they're, if, if there's some punishment they need to get, let's punish them. But at the very least, if they're perpetuating a system that's built on, that feeds off, that, that uh, allows racism to exist, on part of its deputies, its assistants, its its commissioners, those people should lose lose their jobs, and we should appoint someone who or elect someone who will uphold uh, what fairness and justice really would require. Do you believe in discretionary parole, or do you think it should be more automated? Well, I think that there should that parole should be much more predictable the factors that decided should be much more objective 
and there should be much better access to the resources to be able to meet those objections, those, those objectives. And, and what I mean by that is with it being totally discretionary, that two people could, could um, have no way to know exactly what they need to do to, um, to satisfy the parole board they can safely be released. They, because, because the commissioners are going to be um, impacted by factors that those people really have no control over. Whereas if you have a, a sort of a prescription on the front end of someone's incarceration that says, here are the programs we expect you to complete. Here are the things we expect you to do. And if we give people equitable access to do those things and we, we interpret their success or lack of success with an equitable lens, these are all things that are, I don't even know where, how far away we are from these. Yeah, we have a long, we have many longer conversations. Long to have but, but there's, there's a process that makes it more objective, more predictable, um, that is hard to see from where we are right now because it's so not that, not even close. And and you know, I'm, I'm interested to see us move in that direction, but we're not even close at this point. And that gets us to the sentencing project's long term goal around having a 20 year max penalty for all sentences, which does not preclude a really, you know, a pathway out earlier but to set the to set the top at 20 so that all sentences are adjusted downward um in the united states which would follow you know more of a european model of sentencing and hopefully you know really be a solution out of this mass imprisonment era that we've been in for the last 50 years or so and and i want to add to like the, the idea that how far away we are from like um, from like some of the things that we're talking about. And I think that it's important when you have that much distance between uh, where you're at and where you're trying to get that you that we acknowledge the limitations on our imagination. Right now, we live in like, we live in a world where we have been circumscribed in this box where most people believe that there's no other response to harm in the community but to imprison someone. So that's an imagination problem because we were certainly doing other things before prison became like a boom, right? Um, and so it becomes important to understand that these the, that we are in a process of taking steps through experimentation, right? And so we're gonna experiment with a lot of things and every time we experiment, it's going to advance where we're going to change our vantage. And because we have had a different vantage in this journey, we're going to have a different and a more and a fuller imagination. So it's not the goal to be like, what's the solution? This is it. It's like, no, 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 no. As we have said, we are a far way away and we are not even positioned to like paint you out a, 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 this grand solution that's going to solve all our problems, but we do know the system is broken. We do know we need to move, do something else. We need to move in another direction, and so we need to experiment ourselves to better vantage points. And the only rule of that, I would say, is we got to stop doing what we've been doing. That's why, like, diversity on the board may not be the answer, but we got to stop doing what we've been doing. Like, we got, like, and, and when I say diversity on the board, I don't mean, hey, let's get some other backgrounds on. I'm saying, no, for 20 to 30 years, this group of people has been in charge of this process, and they have created a nightmare. You are fired. It shouldn't be people with, with law enforcement backgrounds. We've tried that. We've tried it for 20 and 30 years. It does not work. It has only exacerbated the problem. So let's stop doing that. Like in this, in this idea of we're experimenting our way forward so that we can figure it out, let's stop doing what doesn't work. Let's stop putting people with law enforcement backgrounds on, on boards. Let's just start there. <laughs> so we got the one question, Carlos. <laughs> But so many emotions in one question. We're just getting started, but uh, I want to I want to thank um, Emil and Nicole for being part of this conversation. I think you all add so thank much you. value. Thank you so much to this. Um, the folks who registered are going to be receiving an email um, later today with the recording, and so um, it'll include also links to your works because I think that uh, folks will want to keep in touch. We had a lot of people in the comments asking about like the the studies and all that that you all were referencing. So thank you, Nicole, uh, and thank you, Emil. Um, I'm going to sign you both off right now. Thanks for joining us.
can I just say thank you all and please let's continue to have this conversation because it's not really happening in other circles, I think. No. So. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Thanks, Emil. And Keith, I'll, uh, I'll let you have the last word on, on this. Well, this is, uh, as you can see, this is the beginning of a conversation. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge data gap, but what we see is very disturbing. We should be we should be outraged. Um, we have a growing percentage of our population who are incarcerated are subject to this system, and we need to know if there are biases, and if there are, we need to fix them. If that means change the decision makers, we do that. But it definitely means we need to change this process. We need a new one. Absolutely. Um, so thank you, Keith. Thank you to our Change Lawyers family and our Uncommon Law family and anyone else out, out there who joined us. Um, join us for part three, which is going to happen on May 12th. So Keith and I are going to sign off, but I'm going to put a banner on the screen um, with information on how you can register for the third and final part in this event series that's going to focus on um, decarceration for all, like everyone should, uh, should come home. Um, so thank you, Keith. I'll see you later.